resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for tuning in. Tiam Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, even when we you know, can't do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow, to even host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if like me, you just can't log quite enough hours in front of Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in video or podcast form under the header Digital Media on our website. But back to tonight's program. Uh, the, the, the conversation will likely run 30 to 40 minutes, followed by an audience Q&A. Um, professors Mikhail and Kasaba will take questions uh, from the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. Please keep your questions concise and we'll get to as many as possible. Also know that you can view the event both here uh, on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page if you want to use that platform's closed captioning feature. Know that it's easier for us, though, if you pose your questions over here. Town Hall is adding new events and podcasts every day. Like tonight's event, one of the upsides of our virtual program to the extraordinary conversations they make possible. Um, uh, Jessica Luther and uh, Kavitha Davidson um, on the struggles of being a modern sports fan. Jane Fonda and Elizabeth Lesser about women confronting climate change. Steve Davis in conversation with Chelsea Clinton. Um, it's, it's kind of a terrific fall. And our digital season makes possible a reimagination of our arts programs as well. Our Town Music Chamber series kicks off this week with cellist and artistic director Joshua Roman returning to Seattle for a 10-week residency called Fermata, celebrating an artist's creativity between in-person concert appearances by sharing audio and video glimpses of composing, practicing, listening, rehearsing, resting, all in the context of this massive cultural and social pause. For more information about Fermata and all the rest of our calendar, visit townhallseattle.org. Our work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civics programs in particular uh, are supported by the Real Networks Foundation, the True Brown Foundation, KUOW, and the Wincote Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know, Town Hall is a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight. Uh, to conclude the infomercial portion of your evening, this isn't an easy time for Town Hall or for your booksellers. Uh, since we know you'll want to spend more time with Dr. Mikhail's book, I urge you to buy your own copy here tonight through our local independent partners at Third Place using the conveniently positioned button at the bottom of your screen. All right. Alan McHale is a professor of history and a chair of the Department of History at Yale University. He's widely recognized for his work in Middle Eastern and global history, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. In 2018, he received the Annalise Mayer Research Award of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for internationally distinguished humanities scholars and social scientists. A leading historian of his generation, he's refined our understanding of the past through four prize-winning books on the history of the Middle East. Nature and Empire in Ottoman Egypt and Environmental History was published in 2011. 2012's Water on Sand, Environmental Histories of the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, the Animal in Ottoman Egypt from 2013, which uses the history of the empire's most important province, Egypt, to explain how human interactions with animals changed the world. And in 2017, Under Osman's Tree, the Ottoman Empire, Egypt, and Environmental History analyzed the rich environmental history uh, understand, to understand the longevity, politics, economy, and society of the empire. An expert in the history and politics of the Middle East, Rasat Kassaba has taught undergraduate and graduate students at the Jackson School at the University of Washington for over 30 years. He served as the director of the Jackson School for 10, completing his tenure in June of 2020. Dr. Kasaba has written and edited seven books and over 40 articles, most recently 2011's A Movable Empire, or I should say recently, not most recently, 2011's A Movable Empire, Ottoman Nomads, Migrants, and Refugees, as well as contributions to the Cambridge History of Modern Turkey in 2013. Dr. Mikhail's book, God's Shadow, Sultan Selim, His Ottoman Empire, and the Making of the Modern World is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Alan Mikhail and Rasat Kasaba. Well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us in this uh, very interesting discussion. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege to have Alan uh, with us, even, uh, even though it's virtually. We are hoping that uh, he'll be able to visit us in person and tell us all about how we owe our coffee, about which we're so passionate here in Seattle, to the kinds of things that were going on in the Middle East that Alan is writing about. So um, this is a very uh, important book. It's a book that makes us uh, think in new ways about things that we think we know, 
and books like that actually are, are really the books that uh, that end up being uh, really having a very long uh, shelf life so um, uh, and there is a lot uh, in this book uh, that we can cover and discuss so I urge you to to buy and read and um, and think about all the interesting things that are involved uh, included in it so I will uh, start as we mentioned uh, with uh, some uh, questions uh, which we will spend about 30 40 years discussing and then I will um, go to your questions, which you are supposed to enter um, into ask a question uh, button. And we will try to get to the, as many of those questions as we can in the time that we have. Uh, so uh, thank you for your participation and attention. So Alan, at the center of your book is, of course, the Ottoman Empire and is in, is in particular uh, Sultan Selim I. Now, he ruled between 1512 and 1520, so it's eight years, uh, is not a very long time. But before ascending to the throne, he also served as governor in an important province for over 25 years. And it looks like as a governor, he was acting more like an independent prince and, and accomplished quite a bit in that position. So the time that he was active um, is between 1487 and 1520. Now these are really very, very long time ago, but they tend, and they are actually the time when some very important things were going on in Europe. Uh, in particular, uh, the, uh, the first uh, journey, the travel of Christopher Columbus across the Atlantic that was completed in 1492, which is the beginning of European colonization of the Americas. And of course, Martin Luther's uh, Protestant uh, movement and reformation uh, and, and many other things. So one of your central arguments uh, is that the Ottomans uh, played a very important role uh, in these events. And this role, you say, is not acknowledged properly, not appreciated and not understood. So um, you say actually in your first chapter, whether politicians, pundits and traditional historians like it or not, the world we inhabit is very much an Ottoman one. So I'd like to start with Columbus. And uh, can you tell us how um, his worldview was shaped by his encounter with the Ottoman Empire and other Muslims around the Mediterranean? And how did this impact uh, his uh, subsequent uh, uh, travels uh, to the New World. Thank you, Rashad, very much uh, for, for being here um, and for that question. And thank you to Town Hall for hosting us and to everyone for tuning in. Um, so, so yes, a lot, of, a lot of the work that I'm trying to do in my book is, is to make some things that we um, take as familiar and as well understood and, and to try to make them strange again. So one of them is is the story of, of Columbus. Um, and I think one of the least acknowledged um, and misunderstood aspects of his biography is his constant engagement with the Muslim world, both the Ottoman Empire and other Muslims around the Mediterranean and sometimes Muslims far off um, in other parts of the world and even in his imagination. Um, he was born in 1451 in Genoa, the Italian port city of Genoa, uh, two years before uh, the canonical date of 1453 when the Ottomans conquered um, Constantinople. Um, and as a young Catholic boy, uh, the experience of the loss of that city of Constantinople, described by um, one of the popes as the plucking out of one of the eyes of Christendom, um, the, the loss of that city left a, 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 very, um, a very clear mark on his psyche, as it did for much of Catholic Europe. Um, for Genoa in specific, the loss of that city meant the loss of many of their mercantile ports in the eastern Black Sea. Um, the only way to access the Black Sea from the Mediterranean is through the Bosphorus, of course, um, and, and holding Constantinople gave the Ottomans a stranglehold on the Black Sea trade where um, Genoa had many, many port cities. Um, likewise, in the Eastern Mediterranean um, as well. Genoa was not only a mercantile port, but also a crusader port. So uh, Columbus uh, would have um, you know, understood 
the role of the Crusades for the Catholic Church. He probably would have seen many Crusaders um, coming in and out of the city. Um, so that, that sense of a um, long-standing crusade between um, Christendom and the Muslim world is something that, again, he grew up with in this, in this town. Um, when he first took to the sea as a, um, a sailor for hire in his teenage years, many of his earliest voyages um, took him in close proximity to um, Muslim states around the Mediterranean. So we know um, that in his late teens, he sailed uh, to Tunis to try to retrieve a ship um, that had been captured by uh, the local leader that he was working for at the time. And um, a few years later, a um, family, um, a family firm in Genoa sent him to the island of Chios in the Aegean, um, which is um, today a Greek island, uh, very close to the shore of Anatolia. Um, and the shore at that point had, had basically been conquered by the Ottomans. Um, and when Columbus is there in the 1470s, um, he is regaled with tales of the loss of Constantinople a couple of decades before. There were many soldiers um, from Chios who ba battled um, um, against the Ottomans uh, in the siege of Constantinople in 1453. So those two voyages really brought home to him some of, some of the things that he had learned about as a child, that Islam was um, in the ascendancy, that it was on the move, that it was threatening, that um, it was um, um, something that needed to be acted against. When he was a child, he also read the works of Marco Polo. Um, and in, in that work, he learned about the Grand Khan of the East, which was a mythical potentate that Marco Polo supposedly happened upon in some vague place in Asia, who had an interest in potentially converting to Christianity. Um, and were he to convert to Christianity, the Muslims of the Middle East that control Jerusalem, the ultimate goal of, of all crusaders, um, would be surrounded by Christians. And in one apocalyptic pincer move, the Christians of the world could squeeze the Muslims, destroy them, reclaim Jerusalem for Christendom, and, and Christ's armies would mar march across the earth. So all of this is in Columbus's mind. Um, the story of how he ends up in Iberia is a complicated one that I, I mentioned in the book um, that we don't need to get into now. Um, in 1492, he is in Spain. Um, he is present at the, um, the conquest of Granada by Isabella and Ferdinand. Um, this conquest um, is, is, is uh, the defeat of the last Muslim kingdom of the Iberian Peninsula. So this ends over seven centuries of Muslim rule in, uh, in Iberia. And for Columbus and for many of the people of his generation, this is a sign of things to come, that, um, that um, Christendom is now um, on the front foot, defeating Muslims, rolling them back from Iberia, and soon we'll be able to roll them back from across the, uh, the, the face of the earth. So on the very first page of his voyages, the Atlantic, what we today call the Atlantic voyages, he says that after you, my, my sovereigns, Isabella and Ferdinand, defeated the last Muslims of Granada, you decided to send me to India to find the Grand Khan. So he combines in that very first page of his voyages all of this imagination of Islam that he had been building towards um, for his entire life. And I think that we as you know, lay readers and even some professional historians have in some ways bifurcated the things that Columbus held together. He held together the Reconquista, the reclaiming for Catholicism of all of Iberia, and the Atlantic voyages. Those were, those were two sides of the same coin for him, of trying to find this Grand Khan, um, um, an alternative route to Asia, to defeat the Muslims um, um, of the Middle East and reclaim Jerusalem for Christendom. So I think we've lost the story of Columbus as crusader. And part of the work of my book, by showing the influence of Islam on him, is to bring back some of that story. Um, and this is important also not only for what drives him across the ocean to what will become the Americas, uh, but for what he sees once he arrives in what we today call the Caribbean. Um, 
he describes uh, the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean using terms derived from the old world, um, specifically terms related to Islam. So he describes Taino women, indigenous women, as looking as though they were Moorish women, Muslim women. This is what he writes. He describes some of the weapons that Taino um, men hold as, as being similar to the swords of the Moors of Spain. Um, later on, Cortez, a couple decades later, will describe Montezuma, the Aztec leader, as a sultan. He will write that there are 400 mosques in what is today Mexico. So all of this language of Islam um, is, is present in the imagination of Columbus and these other conquistadors. And I think the only way that we can explain that and understand that is by understanding the role of Islam, the Ottomans and others in Columbus's uh, biography. Thank you. Let's just uh, um, kind of uh, talk about this a little bit more um, and, uh, and talk about religion. Um, as, as you know, um, in many of these histories, I mean, this is a kind of uh, something that continues to this day, but especially uh, dealing with this early periods, um, the, um, the confrontation between Europeans and um, the Islamic world or, you know, Ottoman Empire and other empires in that part of the world is usually presented in terms of uh, clash between uh, religions. Um, so the reality, of course, is a lot more complicated. I mean, you do make the point in your in the book that Ottoman Empire actually was a Christian majority empire, especially in the early part of its history, and continued to be that for a long time. Um, so that is really on the ground. It was a very complicated situation. So, but in your kind of understanding, um, uh, what do you feel? What do you think religion? plays in this history? What role religion plays in this history uh, in, in, on both sides of this divide? Right. Um, you know, I think look, looking back from our vantage point today, I think, I think in some ways we, we see religion everywhere um, when, when looking at that history. I think that's worth thinking about. Um, I think people at the time obviously thought about religion in very different kinds of ways. Um, so if, if we take the comparative for the moment of, let's say, Europe and the Ottoman Empire, um, uh, for the first two centuries of Ottoman rule, let's say, it is the case that the, the ruling elite of the empire are almost exclusively Muslim. The vast majority of the people who live in the empire are not, are Orthodox Christians of one kind or another. Um, that's very different than the situation in most of Europe, where the ruling elite and the populace are of the same confession, of the same religion. Um, and I think that sets up a very different dynamic for state and society relations. Um, so, so as you said, um, for the first 220 years of Ottoman history, um, it's a majority Orthodox population. So if we think about the history of the United States, it, the United States is almost 250 years old. So as long as the United States has been around, the Ottoman Empire was a majority Christian state. So I think we have to take that very seriously when thinking about the history of the Ottoman Empire in that period and, and later as well. What did that mean on the ground? It meant a certain degree of communal autonomy, right? That communities of non-Muslims had some authority over their, their communal affairs, marriages, um, divorces, rights of various kinds. Um, it also meant that they didn't have certain rights within the empire. So, um, you know, their, their legal testimony in court, for example, was not worth as much as that of uh, a Muslim. Um, it, it meant that they had a, a contentious relationship to serving in the military, for example, all of those kinds of things. Um, if we again go, go to the situation in Europe, um, we could go to 1492, which we were just discussion, discussing. 1492 is not only the year in which Columbus sets sail, it's also the year, thanks to the Reconquista, in which, as I said, we have the, the last Muslim kingdom of, uh, in Spain is defeated, and uh, the Jews of Spain are expelled um, from Iberia. The, the process of expulsion takes quite a while, but it begins in that year, 
and and the Moors, the Muslims of Spain, will will also begin a process of expulsion that will take much longer and last into the 17th century. But this idea of, of expelling the non-Christian population, the non-majority religion population of Europe, there's no equivalent to that in the Ottoman Empire. Now, I don't want to, again, sugarcoat anything um, and say that everything was was rosy and wonderful in the Ottoman Empire, but but that that basic difference I think is very very important for us to understand, and and to even to even see the fact that a lot of the 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 Jews who are expelled from Spain eventually end up in the Ottoman Empire, and I discuss this in the book at some length. Um, so 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 um, in in the broadest sense, I think that's very important for us to think about when thinking about the role of religion in in the Mediterranean in this period. Despite what I just said, it is the case that religion was used for purposes of warfare, right? The rhetoric of fighting against non-Muslims was very, very important in the same way that it was for, for Christians fighting against non-Christians. Um, um, and it's, it's, it's also very important for, for understanding some of the, the rhetoric of how the empire sees itself. And that's something that I spent a lot of time on in the book. Um, during Salim's lifetime, I think that changes um, um, to a great degree, and, and we could talk about that a little bit more um, as we go along, uh, per perhaps. I I'll also just say on the, on the question of religion, um, again, th thinking as moderns as we look back, um, there are many, many examples, as, as you well know, of interactions of people of, of various faiths in, in ways that we would talk about as constructive or as positive or something like that. Um, the sharing of cultural norms across confessional lines, the, the sharing of literary culture, um, the sharing of ideas, um, um, work bringing people together in various kinds of ways. Um, so it, it, it's a very complicated story and it depends at, at which scale that we're talking about. But, but I think in the broadest um, sense, especially up until Salim's period, this idea that the majority of the population um, being of the same religion as the ruling elite is, is something that we have to keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, it is, um, in a way, um, you know, personal kind of um, practice of religion and the role it plays in communities as opposed to when it becomes almost like a political ideology for uh, these states or empires to, def to defend themselves or define themselves in relationship mm -hmm. in opposition mm -hmm. to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's important to distinguish. And also, I think sometimes people uh, forget that some of the Crusades were actually organized against uh, non-Catholic Christian communities as much as uh, they were against Muslims uh, in that part. That's right. So, yeah. That's right. So um, I'd like to move uh, to uh, Selim now. Uh, he is really uh, the, um, the central figure in the drama or the history that you are uh, telling us. Um, he is an interesting choice. I mean, there are those of us who study this history know that he is very important, but of course he's not really uh, that well known. <laughs> um, and, and when you read about him, um, in some ways he doesn't come across as a, a very pleasant person either. He has um, murdered his uh, half-brothers and almost, I mean, he pushed uh, his father off the throne and he was not really supposed to. I mean, it was the third in line, actually, to ascend, and he kind of elbows his way in. And uh, his campaigns are extraordinarily forceful, um, but very successful in a very short period of time. So he's a complicated person. So I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about him. I think it would be important, interesting to kind of hear um, a little bit about his background, but how he was uh, educated, how he was trained. Uh, and then what do you think has motivated him? Because uh, as you know, I mean, as the book, the whole subject, of course, is that all of his campaigns were in the East and he fought other Muslim empires. So just tell us, to help us understand him a little bit. Right. Um, so, so as you said, probably the most famous Sultan that people know about in Ottoman history is Suleiman, Suleiman the Magnificent, right? Um, he's, the, he's the most famous Sultan um, in, in, in the West. We might argue in, in, in Turkey and other places. Also, um, Salim is his father, as you know, um, and one of the goals of the book is to argue that um, the, the 
the reign of Salim and, and more, more really the span of his life, the 50 years of his life. He's born in 1470 and dies in 1520. Um, that that is really the hinge of uh, Ottoman history. And why do I say that? Um, in 1516, 1517, he conquers the Mamluk Empire, uh, which I'll talk about more in a second. Um, that almost triples the size of the empire. It gives it the shape more or less that it will have from the early 16th century until the early 20th century. So for 400 years, Selim basically sets the shape of uh, the geographic shape of the Ottoman Empire. It changes the fortunes of the empire, that geographical expansion in all kinds of ways. Um, it, it makes the Ottomans the dominant power in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, it makes them the dominant um, political power in North Africa. It puts them into the Indian Ocean world through the Red Sea. Um, it gives them territory that further moves them east in Iraq. Um, and it, that geographic expansion also sets a tremble into Europe, um, that now this empire is this gargantuan state, going from a state that was um, you know, sort of centered around the Aegean and the Balkans and, and Western Anatolia, and now a, uh, an empire on three continents. It also changes the, I, I think, some of the fundamental characteristics of the empire. So going back to what we were discussing before about religion, this is the moment in which the Ottomans become uh, a majority Muslim empire for the first time in its history, that the, the majority of the population um, is Muslim. It, it wins for the Ottomans Mecca and Medina, the, the arguably most important cities in Islam. Um, it also brings them Damascus, Cairo, Aleppo, Jerusalem, very, very important cities for Islamic learning, for the arts, um, for the kind of patrimony of the Muslim world, that, that now the Ottomans are the holders of that patrimony, and Salim in specific. Um, so, um, so for all those reasons, um, I, I think Salim is, is much more important than Suleiman. Um, and we, we could have that debate, um, and, and that, that, that's a debate that, that, that many could have. His reign is very short, yes, only eight years. Suleiman is the longest um, um, reigning sultan in Ottoman history. Salim's reign is very short. But I think the things that, he, that Salim is able to accomplish during his life in some ways set Suleiman up for all the successes that, that he will have later on. Um, and, and, and no other sultan expands the empire as much as, as Salim did in his, in his reign. Um, so in terms of what that expansion looked like, you're right that it was almost exclusively in the east. Um, the major uh, territorial acquisition that, that he wins is this defeat of the Mamluk Empire in 1516, 1517. Um, the Mamluk Empire based in Cairo um, that... Um, in some ways was a kind of brotherly empire to the Ottomans. They emerged roughly at the same period. Um, they together um, held uh, the, the trade routes to the east that um, you know, worried Europeans a great deal. Um, they fought against one another for territory in what is today um, southern Anatolia and Syria. Um, but but, but that, that victory for Salim expands the empire greatly. The other major campaign that he undertakes um, a few years before that is against the Safavid Empire of Iran. Um, and um, that is important for a number of reasons, um, not so much really for territory. It does win some territory in Eastern Anatolia and helps to solidify the East of the empire, um, but really as a kind of ideological blow against the Safavid Empire. The Safavid Empire um, emerged in 1501. Um, and as you were discussing before in terms of the, the rhetoric of religion, um, the Safavid Empire fuses Shiism to um, a tradition of Persian kingship to, to really make Shiism the, the, the kind of legitimating force of their imperial rule. And in some ways, the Ottomans will react against that to make Sunniism much more important for the rhetoric of the Ottoman Empire. And of course, the winning of Mecca and Medina is, is very, very important for that project as well. And we see similar things happening in Europe between um, Protestants and Catholics um, beginning in this period and moving forward. 
Okay, so more to Salim. Um, um, he is the fourth son of his father, Bayezid. Um, he is, um, as you said, not favored by his father or by anyone else um, in the imperial elite to take over the throne. Um, the eldest son of Bayezid dies early, and, and there are two surviving sons ahead of Salim, uh, and the eldest is, is really the favored one up to that point. Um, his father makes very clear just how unfavored Salim is by posting him very, very far away from Istanbul, the city of Trabzon, on the um, southeast corner of the Black Sea, which in some ways is the furthest place you can be from Istanbul and still be in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and proximity to the throne is, of course, um, what one of the advantages one needs to um, succeed uh, um, in, in the imperial uh, succession battle. Um, so it, it makes very clear that Salim is, is, is not, the favored, uh, not the favored successor. Um, as I try to show in the book, and as you, you mentioned before, he spends longer in Trabzon than he does anywhere else. And it's really there that he develops into the administrator, the military leader, um, if you like, uh, the thinker, that, that, that he is, that will bring him to the throne. And to understand that period of his life, it's very important to understand his relationship to his mother. Um, he is posted to Trabzon with his mother, um, as almost all of the princes were when they became governors. Um, sometimes they're posted when they're very young, um, and, and they're posted um, to these places with their mothers. And, and because they're so young, it's really their mothers who are the ones in charge of rule in these in these locales, of course, uh, with an imperial um, entourage around them, the mothers are responsible for educating their sons, um, for teaching them some of the imperial arts, um, for protecting them, and for helping to position them in the coming succession battle. If um, one's son becomes a sultan, one's own station will obviously rise as a result of that as well. So mothers have a vested interest in the success of their, of their sons. So it's in Trabzon, um, working with his mother, that he learns about market regulation, how to control trade, how to write a royal order, etc. It's also important to understand um, his position on the frontier of the empire in the east. Um, the east in this period for the Ottoman Empire is very unruly. There are lots of um, um, tribal groups and various um, um, ethnic states that are vying for power. There's a lot of raiding and trading across borders. So he learns in Trabzon, I argue in the book, that a sultan has to be not defensive, but offensive. Has to strike first against one's enemies and not sit back. If you sit back, enemies will chip away territory, they will raid from your markets, etc. And this is in contrast to his father, for example, who is very interested in stability, in um, 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 having peace treaties with the empire's enemies. Um, and, and Salim uses this to contrast himself with his father um, in, in, in his play for the throne. So getting at Salim's personality is somewhat difficult, right? Um, we don't have a diary, for example. We have some poetry, we have his letters, we have his orders. Um, the poetry is not very good by my reading. Um, it's largely about politics and about territory. Um, so he's clearly very, very ambitious, very, very focused on his goals. Um, and, and, you, and you see that in his kind of plotting of how to get from Trabzon to the palace. Um, so I read a lot into that, that strategy of turning disadvantage on the frontier in Trabzon, far away from the empire, into an advantage for himself. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not interested in kind of trying to do a psychohistory of Salim or um, um, figuring out his emotions and feelings. Um, that, that's a very difficult thing to do, of course, um, but I, 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 I try to read into his actions as much as I can. Okay. So, um, but uh, based on that reading, though, um, what uh, would you say that his his uh, his overarching goal was was to make sure that the Ottoman Empire was the uncontested, unrivaled um, 
Islamic empire uh, of its age. Was this something that motivated him uh, in terms of, especially, you know, against the Safavids, but also um, uh, with the Mamluks? Yeah, I mean, my own view is that he's interested in territory and power. The language of religion for him is rhetorical. So if you read the letters between Ismail and the, the, the Safavid leader and Salim that they exchange before, um, before battle, they use the language of Sunnism and Shiism quite a lot. Um, I, I, I think, that's, um, I, I think that's, that, that's more a language of, of insult and of rhetoric rather than about true belief. I think it's, it's hard to get at the religiosity of Salim. There's not much that suggests that he's a very pious person. Um, there's not much to suggest that he's not, really. Um, but but I, I think it's really just raw ambition, um, um, political, um, political striving, territory, geography that motivates him. So um, I want to before I ask sort of a you know a, a bigger kind of broader question about writing history, uh, I have to ask you about coffee because we are in Seattle. So uh, can you okay. remind us uh, the coffee connection here? <laughs> the coffee connection, sure. Um, right. So uh, coffee um, comes to the world basically from Ethiopia. That's where the the the, the, fir our, the first instances that we have of coffee growing, the, the coffee plant. Um, Ethiopia is just across the Red Sea from Yemen. Um, and at some point, probably in the 13th or 14th century, coffee jumps from Ethiopia to Yemen through trade networks. Um, some people think that um, religious mystics traveling from Yemen to Ethiopia picked it up and brought it back with them. Whatever the case may be, it ends up in Yemen. Um, it grows well in the soils in Yemen. Um, when, when Salim's armies uh, defeat the Mamluk Empire, they win Yemen as a, as, as a part of that conquest. Um, it takes a few decades for Yemen to be fully incorporated into the Ottoman Empire, but it's there that the Ottomans um, um, stumble upon coffee. And it's the unity that Salim achieves in 1516, 1517 of connecting a place like Yemen to Cairo, to Syria, to Istanbul, two places in the Balkans, and all the connections that come with that unity that allows coffee to move up from Yemen up through what is today Saudi Arabia, then into Egypt, up through Syria, eventually to Istanbul, into the Balkans, Europe, then east into um, Iraq, Iran, so forth. Um, the first coffee houses um, 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 opened in Syria in the 1530s. Coffee is in Istanbul in the 1540s. So very, very quickly, um, coffee, coffee moves through these, these networks up into major Ottoman cities and on from there. Um, the Ottomans uh, were key players in the coffee trade for several centuries um, from Yemen. They control much of the world's supply, uh, both to the east and um, to the west. Um, Amsterdam is a major coffee trading market. Um, and um, they also um, develop various kinds of institutions around the consumption of coffee. So um, the origins of, of the coffee house we can really think about in the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so in some ways, it, it's, it's thanks to Selim um, that, that, that coffee was allowed to spread up through the Middle East to other parts, um, to other parts of the world. Thank you. So I want to uh, remind our uh, audience that they can enter their questions. There are already a few questions there. I will get to them uh, just in a few moments. Uh, before I do that, I want to ask one more question, Alan, and that has to do with uh, how you approach a subject like this. As you know, um, uh, there are uh, two views about the Ottoman um, role in this expansion. One we talked about a little bit, it was, it is this clash between two cultures that kind of scared the Europeans and pushed them away. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is other uh, interpretations of this where uh, there's a lot more emphasis on, um, on these on the ground relationships that you uh, talked about a little bit. So the Armenian merchants and the Jewish merchants and the Christians and the Muslims. So they 
create this network that kind of covers a very large geography. And we can think about the Ottoman Empire or the Crusaders or other states or the Italian cities trying to control this politically, but not really succeeding that much. So it's kind of a different kind of dynamic. So um, uh, this is a big book with a big, very big uh, argument and a thesis. Uh, can you kind of tell us how you see uh, that, how you see your work in relationship to uh, those two perspectives? Yeah, um, so I think um, it's both, obviously. It's major political figures and political events and wars, um, pandemics. Um, those things matter in history. Um, likewise, uh, the actions of individuals on the ground, non-elites, um, uh, people that don't write their own histories, that don't make it into history books, play a vital role, obviously, um, in historical processes. Um, and we have to keep both at play in the stories that we tell if we want to accurately understand um, um, historical processes and, and the past more generally. This book it, on that spectrum is, is very much tilted to the side of, of looking at major figures and looking at wars and territorial expansion and these huge processes. Um, and the reason for that, there are a couple reasons for that. One is, one of the major goals of this book, going back to the earlier part of our conversation, is to insert the Ottomans, Muslims, Islam, the Muslim world, into some of these grand narratives that we have about how our world came to be. So, um, the, the, um, the commingling, for lack of a better word, between Europe and the Americas, I think most people would say is a major sort of factor in understanding the last 500 years of history. Um, the trade between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean is vitally important for understanding the last 500 years of history. Something like the Protestant Reformation and other forms of religious reform are important. Um, World War I is important. Um, the creation of the nation state, all of those things. Um, and so going after those grand narratives, I wanna, want to participate in those narratives by, by kind of tweaking those grand narratives with, with, with a slightly different grand narrative about the Ottomans and Salim and the Muslim world and Islam and its role in those other stories so that we can no longer think of 1492 without thinking about Islam or we can't think about the Protestant Reformation with at least acknowledging that the Ottomans had some role in that. Or we can't think about the rise of commercial relationships um, without thinking about uh, the role of the Ottomans in that. We can't drink our coffee without thinking about the Ottomans. All of those things. So, so, um, so I am telling a big story that's trying to, to, um, to needle its way into those other big, big stories. Um, along the way, I do talk about, you know, the merchants of Salonika, for example. Um, um, I talk about um, some small-scale traders along the way, all of those kinds of things. In my earlier work, um, you know, almost all of it was about non-elites, peasants, farmers, even non-humans, animals. Um, so this is, this is, in some ways, this book is going to the other end of the spectrum to tell the very large story. But I don't want to, um, um, and I don't believe that, you know, Selim did everything in world history. That ev that everything is um, is is a result of what he did um, in his fifty years on this earth. Um, he is really my vehicle um, for 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 doing that other project of inserting Islam and the Ottomans into these these bigger stories of world history. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Let me just get these uh, some of these questions. Um, uh, so, um, Natasha uh, from Thornton Park. Uh, so, um, she's asking, um, did you begin writing the book with the stories already in mind? Or is this something that sort of evolved, the story evolved as you read more and thought about what you were reading uh, about this history? So, is, was it an organic process or is it did you already have the story in mind before writing? 
That's a great question. Thanks. Um, so I guess I came to this by, I'll answer that in a couple ways. Um, up to this point, most of my interests have been about the history of the Ottoman Empire in the Arab world. That history really begins in 1516, 1517 with um, the incorporation of the Arab world into the Ottoman Empire. Now, for historians of the Mamluk Empire, this is kind of the end of the story. And so they sort of end with, and then the Ottomans came and the Mamluk Empire was no longer. For Ottoman historians um, who are interested at all in the Arab world, many of them are not, um, this is the beginning. So, okay, now our story begins. So at first I wanted to dwell in that period, a few years before 1516, a few years after 1517, to try to understand that period on its own terms because I'm interested in this history. Um, so that, that was an interest I had. Um, I was also interested in telling this as a big global history of trying to understand that moment as, um, as a major turning point in, in the, last, uh, you know, the, the, the last few centuries of global history. Um, and I was trying to figure out ways of doing that. At the same time, I was teaching a course that was um, the history of the world around the year 1500, so 1350 to 1700. And so I was reading, you know, things like Columbus um, and um, all kinds of material. Um, and so, you know, reading the Columbus, teaching the Columbus um, journal, um, that's when I stumbled upon these kinds of flashes of Islam that, you know, Taino women look like. Moorish women. And so that was very strange. Um, and that raised all kinds of questions. So I thought I'm, that was very interesting to me. And I wanted to bring that into the story. So I, so I was looking for ways of telling these big stories about Islam and world history pinned on this year, 15, 16, 15, 17. And as I was saying before, Salim in some ways became the Trojan horse to allow me to do that. Because his years are very convenient, first of all, 1470 to 1520. And he is the one who undertakes this major expansion of the Ottoman Empire. Um, and so that, that's how it evolved. I mean, I had the, this kind of set of interests and questions and was trying to think of a way of bringing them all together. I wanted to tell a good story. Um, and, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted to reach an audience that, um, you know, I didn't reach in my more academic work. Um, and so that meant hooking into narratives that people already knew, 1492, the Reformation, those kinds of things. Um, and so that's what I, I tried to do in the book. Very good. So Seth uh, is asking, um, it's a fairly specific question. Um, and um, are there any architectural or aesthetic aspects of Selim's rule that reflect this new unity? I mean, he is uniting these really, um, you know, it's all Islamic world, but obviously a very diverse background. So um, all the way from Yemen to Cairo to Syria, Istanbul to Balkans. Do you, um, are there any um, uh, architectural uh, traces or, um, you know, symbols of this unity? Sure. Um, yeah, there, I can answer that in a couple ways. I mean, um, one is um, what uh, the empire does in its newly acquired territories, um, mostly in large cities like Mecca and Medina, Cairo. Um, so to refurbish certain sites, um, certain uh, um, significant uh, mosques, for example, or squares, um, building fountains, um, um, creating various kinds of institutions that will serve the needs of, of communities. Um, a very good example of this is in Trabzon. Um, so when Salim and his mother arrive in Trabzon, um, it is only recently incorporated into the Ottoman Empire. 90% of the population is Greek Orthodox. Um, um, the, the, the Ottomans are newcomers in this city. And much of the time that Salim and his mother spend in the city um, is, is devoted to a process of Ottomanization and Islamization. Um, and you see that architecturally. So for example, 
um, Salim's mother, Gulbahar, uh, founds a very important pious foundation in the city. So an endowment that includes a mosque, a soup kitchen, an orphanage, a library, etc. cetera. Um, and this, this, this puts a physical fingerprint of the Ottomans of Gulbahar on the city that remains to this day. So still today in Trabzon, you can visit the Ladies' Foundation, as it's known. Um, and, and so that's a very permanent um, symbol of the city becoming Ottoman, if you like. Of course, it takes almost a century for the, for the demographics of the population to change, but, but something like this is how the city is becoming Ottoman, and, and, and of course becoming more Muslim, right? The, the, this mosque, its minaret, etc. cetera. Um, so, so there's that outward... Um, um, projection of Ottoman power into acquired territories. There's also an architectural um, reverberation in the city of Istanbul itself. So, for example, um, in Cairo, when Selim arrives in Cairo, um, uh, he um, and his and his entourage see uh, the schools that the Mamluks um, have across the city, the madrasas, um, in which people are taught Quran and, and whatever. Um, and they replicate some of those back in Istanbul once they return to Istanbul. Um, there is there is a, the construction of various madrasas that are modeled on the madrasas in, in Cairo. So those are the specific architectural implications, um, which is what your question was about. But there are all kinds of other cultural aspects of conquest. Okay, well, there is this question. I mean, it's, uh, uh, as you know, um, this is from Amar. Um, as you know, um, there is some criticism raised by some historians about, uh, about your book. And um, so I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, how do you, I mean, how do you kind of um, uh, make sense of this kind of reaction um, to uh, work that kind of tries to um, put the Ottoman Empire at the center of this important historical period. How, how do you interpret that? Yeah, I mean, I think whenever, whenever historians try to make bold new arguments, um, you know, th there's there's going to be some who uh, will react against that, um, and that's something that I knew would happen with this book. Um, you know, there have been many many positive reviews of the book. Um, there have been negative reviews of the negative reviews of the book. So if people are interested in that, you know, I would encourage them to seek out um, all of the different viewpoints um, of the book. But this is a book that, that I, I really wanted to make a bold argument with and be provocative. It is meant to be a, a, a provocation that I hope will push people to, um, you know, dispute certain aspects of the book um, to think differently about some of the historical processes that they think they've long understood. Um, so, you know, I mean, I'm encouraged by, by the, um, you, you know, the, 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 the um, engaged responses that, that the book has elicited so far. Thank you. So, Bill, uh, <clears throat> this goes back to Columbus's motive. Um, and the question is whether... Um, I mean, there's this other um, kind of uh, explanation that he was trying to sell this idea to um, Isabel and, and Ferdinand so that uh, they would fund his voyages, that, uh, mm -hmm. that what he was saying was not really uh, genuine in that sense. All he needed was this support. I mean, do you, what, what, do you, what do you make of this? I mean, uh, sure. Uh, you know that 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 argument exists out there. I mean, I, I'm reading the sources that are in front of us, um, in which uh, he speaks in certain kinds of ways. Other people speak in certain kinds of ways. His actions are are also revealing of intention and and motive. Um, you know, the language of crusade is not something that is is unique to Columbus in this period. I mean, again. Many of the other conquistadors use this same language. Isabella and Ferdinand use this language. And this is something that is really baked into the bread of Christendom in this period. Um, and so Columbus is, is an exemplar of that. Um, and so I feel confident in, in making those claims precisely because they were so widespread um, across 
um, across you know different cultures of Christendom around the Mediterranean. Yes. Um, so Natasha actually uh, has another question, um, and this is uh, again about Selim. Uh, and the whole, the, he's, uh, uh, as you know, he's, he's known as Selim the Grim, and, mm -hmm. um, or Resolute. Um, do you think, is this a fair uh, description of him? Uh, if not, uh, what would you use to describe him as, uh, knowing that God's shadow was both a moniker for the Sultan and the name of your book? Right. Um, Good question. I, I don't know if I have a you know a a, a new sobriquet for um, for for Salim. Um, yeah, I mean he you know he he killed a lot of people as Rashad was saying earlier, um, including members of his own family. Um, he he was um, a sultan who was very engaged in warfare for most of his reign, um, if not most of his life. Um, so he's a he's a very um, you know, he, he's, a, he's the man of his age. That, that, that's how I think of it. I mean, sovereigns across the world were executing and torturing and killing people left and right. Um, you know, there, was a, there are specific reasons um, that, that um, Salim, you know, might have a, a little more claim to being more violent than others. So, so he leads one of the largest domestic massacres in Ottoman history. Um, during his campaign against the Safavids, in which he kills 40,000 of his own Shiite subjects. Um, and that remains until the end of the 19th century as one of the largest domestic massacres in Ottoman history. So, you know, he, he did a lot of bad stuff. And, you know, the point of my book is not to celebrate or to destroy Salim or to say that he was a wonderful person or a, hor or, or a horrible person, but to recognize um, the, the historical importance of, of um, that period and of his reign in particular. Um, Hannah Cooper uh, wants to know about uh, the influence of women. And, and this is, you already mentioned about his mother, but of course this is a, a, a manifestation of a much sort of broader issue mm -hmm. um, that has been studied a little, but mm -hmm. not enough really. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, sure, both sure. on Selim in particular, but in the whole palace structure. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, right, so, so this has been studied um, um, most completely by a historian named Leslie Pierce um, in a book called The Imperial Harem, um, in which she describes this system, um, it, it, uh, the role of women in the imperial um, dynasty. So, um, one of the aspects of this is what I was talking about with, with Salim and his mother, um, and, and I don't think I mentioned it when I was discussing it earlier, um, is this idea of one mother, one son. So within the Ottoman dynastic household, there are wives, so the Sultan has legal wives, um, and concubines. Um, the offspring of um, concubine and Sultan or prince um, is born free, um, and um, has the rights of any freeborn person, which is very, a, a very different system of, of slavery than um, we understand in the United States, for example. Um, these women who were concubines in the harem were technically slaves. They um, are usually conquered during battle or bought on various slave markets. In this period, mostly from the Balkans, what is today Ukraine and Southern Russia, sometimes the Caucasus. Um, and um, once in the imperial harem, again, of a sultan or a prince, um, once one of these concubines bore a son to the sovereign, sexual relations between them stopped. And that mother, um, her fortunes are then tied up in the fortunes of her son. So in the case of Salim and Gulbahar, um, she has a vested interest in, in him succeeding um, because as his station rises, so too does her station rise. And from the Ottoman dynasty's perspective, this, this is a good system because it means that all the sons have a patroness, someone who's looking out for their education, their well-being, their safety, their health, etc. cetera. Um, and it means that they, they automatically have a team of a, a young boy and a mother and an entourage that can help them um, to become the sovereigns that, that ultimately 
the dynasty needs to survive. So it is the case that in over 600 years of Ottoman history, um, the line is unbroken from the first sultan to the last. They are all um, the male heirs um, from the first um, sultan, all of their mothers being concubine women. That's a very interesting fact of Ottoman history. Most of these women, again, raised in a religion other than Islam, usually in a culture other than Ottoman Turkish culture, speaking a language other than Ottoman Turkish, usually again. Um, so so that's, that, that's interesting to think about, that, that every sultan has a, a foreign mother, if you like, um, and what that might mean for the rule of the empire, the worldview of these sultans, um, um, things like that. Um, so beyond, beyond that, these mothers, um, because they are so crucial to the furtherance of the line of Osman, of the, the continuity of the empire, they wield enormous politics within the household structure, right? Um, of, again, positioning their sons, of jockeying for power. We have examples um, in which um, sultans are off in battle, um, and some of the women of the harem are actually issuing orders um, and kind of running the politics um, of the harem um, instead of their um, uh, of the of the the uh, princes and and the sultans. Um, so they they wield enormous power. The, the harem, if anybody has visited the palace in Istanbul, it's literally at the center of of the imperial power of the Ottoman Empire, right? Join, conjoined to the imperial residence of the sultan. Um, so, given that proximity, again, we, we, we were talking about earlier in the case of Trabzon and the Sons, that proximity to power um, is, is one of the crucial keys to power. Um, women in the harem play an enormous role um, in, in the politics of the empire. Well, thank you. So, uh, we are uh, coming to the end of the time, uh, it passes very quickly. I just want to um, uh, kind of comment and remind the audience that uh, in this country, of course, in the United States, uh, part of what's going on is this um, coming to terms uh, with history, really understanding um, uh, the richness or the diverse background of people that made the United States going back um, uh, 4th to 15th century and beyond. So, so that's a very important sort of debate discussion that's going on in this country, as we know. It's exactly similarly, it's true um, in places like Turkey, uh, even though Selim is someone who, um, uh, who was a sultan, you know, a long time ago, uh, he is very much, um, in political discussions and debates. Um, the third uh, bridge that was built across the Bosphorus was named after him. Um, and the current uh, president of Turkey is often referred to as Sultan and uh, which Sultan we don't know, but that's, uh, that's something he, he seems to like. Uh, so it's a, it's it, the topics that are included in this book and our discussion are very relevant to uh, some uh, current issues and debates that are going on uh, in the United States, in Europe, in Turkey, in other parts of the Middle East. Um, I do want to thank Alan for being with us uh, and uh, and also writing this book. Uh, it's really uh, something that brings. Um, uh, you know, his depth of knowledge about that part of the world, which he's shown us in his other publications, into a grand synthesis, which is very, um, very useful, uh, very helpful. So thank you. Uh, Mommy regret is that you couldn't be here in person. Uh, hopefully we can remedy that at some uh, point in the future. And thank you also for staying up late uh, from the East. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for shot. Yeah, and I just want to thank both of you for um, for being here and presenting with us. Um, it's really, we love provocative histories. So thank you for bringing this to us, Dr. McCall. Um, and uh, I want to thank everybody for watching tonight. Uh, if you want to follow more Town Hall content, you can follow this Crowdcast channel. Um, we had a, an event earlier that was about um, very 
local and recent history, and then you can hop right over and go uh, back into ancient history. So it's really pretty fun. Um, I want to encourage everybody to buy the book through this uh, stream. Uh, the link at the uh, middle bottom, center bottom of the uh, screen, that's going to take you right over to Third Place Books where you can purchase a copy and support our local bookstores. Um, thank you both again so much for your uh, presentation tonight. And hopefully we will see you again soon, hopefully in person sometime. So thanks and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you, Alan.